Hello, I'm Paul Pirello, and welcome to The Philly Factor. Well, on our program today, you want to pay particularly close attention because we're going to feature one of uh, the historic sites in Philadelphia. One, whether you have lived in this city your entire life, perhaps you're a transplant uh, to Philadelphia, chances are you have heard of the Betsy Ross House. Better yet, hopefully, you have visited the Betsy Ross House in Old City. Uh, her home is literally uh, tucked away in the most historic square mile in America. You could still explore the legend of Betsy Ross, Old Glory, and really become enveloped in the sights and sound of the 18th century as your tour um, takes you through Betsy Ross's house, her seamstress shop, and here to join us on our program to talk about all things Betsy Ross. I'm happy to uh, introduce Kim Staub, Collections Manager at the Betsy Ross House. And Kim, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, we were talking before time that, you know, when you live in Philadelphia, chances are uh, you may have gone on a school trip or mm -hmm. two or three, and one of those stops is the Betsy Ross House. And even before we get into what great offerings you have especially during the summer season. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Betsy Ross because mm -hmm. many people may think that she's just a figure out of history that has really no relevance. Mm -hmm. Some people may turn around and argue that she had a lot of relevance and maybe her stitching the first mm -hmm. old glory, the first uh, American flag. But uh, let's get to the essence of the woman. Who really was Betsy Ross? Um, Betsy Ross was an 18th century upholsterer. She was, um, a lot of people confuse her as a seamstress, but seamstresses make clothing, upholsterers dress the home, so mattresses, bed hangings, curtains, balances, um, even blinds she made. Mm -hmm. um, so she was trained upholsterer and she was asked by Washington to make a flag. Um, so a lot of people remember her for that one moment in 1776, but she was really a woman who made a lifelong career out of making flags. Uh, she made flags for the government for over 50 years, um, at one point having the contract on the Schuylkill Arsenal. Um, that sent flags out west to the Native Americans as they were extending the country um, to the War of 1812 down in New Orleans. So she was a very, very um, prominent flag maker in Philadelphia. And I would think a very prominent business person because given 18th century America, as young mm -hmm. as the country was, was it unusual for a woman to be in a position of being a, a business person? Uh, no, there was actually a lot of 18th century business owners, um, you know, a lot of women were running the business sort of behind the shadow of their husband's name. Mm -hmm. um, we know, for instance, that when Betsy Ross married her third husband, he had a background in tanning and he actually worked in the U.S. Customs Office. But suddenly, right after their marriage, John Claypool became an upholsterer. Mm. So John Claypool didn't know anything about upholstery work, but Betsy was running the business for him. Um, widows, of course, could run their own business. Um, so actually, one of the things that we try to do at the Betsy Ross House is tell the story of her as a businesswoman, but also um, sort of other women as business owners as well. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the legend of Betsy Ross, and you can't avoid the subject or the topic of whether, in fact, she did stitch mm -hmm. the first flag as requested by uh, General Washington at that time. Um, you know, I had an eye-opening experience in a freshman college course here at LaSalle, uh, writing a paper on Betsy Ross, mm -hmm. and found out uh, this was a long time ago, <laughs> not quite the 18th century, almost, but uh, found out that, you know, uh, where did you get your information? Because there really is no evidence mm -hmm. that shows that Betsy Ross did, in fact, stitch the first American flag. Yeah, so the story goes back to, it's actually an oral history passed down to her family. Um, so we have affidavits from her grandchildren, one of her daughters, some nieces and nephews, that all sort of confirm that, yes, my aunt, grandmother, mother told us the story of how she made a flag for George Washington. Um, there's no sort of um, plain receipt from George Washington that says, I, Mistress Ross, I paid her for making a flag today. Um, but her earliest flag receipt for making flags is 1777. Um, we know that she know, knew George Washington. She actually made bed hangings for him when she was still married to John Ross um, before he passed away um, in 1774. So we do know that she was familiar with Washington. He knew her skill at the needle. He knew of her politics, that she, was, she and her husband John were supportive of the revolutionary cause which at the time she made the flag or would have made the flag, you know, it was treason. So, so um, keeping things on the quiet was, was very important at the time. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of evidence, but what, what we try to talk about at the Betsy Ross House is whether or not she made this first flag. Um, it's important, but we think that Betsy Ross, her whole life story, um, she was born in 1752 during the height of colonial rule and died in 1836 when Andrew Jackson was president. So she saw the entire founding of the nation in the city where all of these things were happening. So her life is more than just a single moment. Um, her, her weight carries. Uh, and it, it's so remarkable that you can step literally in her footsteps where she 
worked and where she walked at the Betsy Ross house. And, you know, it, it, it truly is remarkable in at least the last time I visited the Betsy Ross house is that uh, you really get a chance to be up close and personal with history, um, you know, touring the house and, you know, being in some of the rooms that Betsy herself lived in. Yeah, and I think one of our visitors' most common um, surprises is how small the rooms are, how small the stairs are. Um, we're very fortunate, actually, that the Betsy Ross House is one of the few middle class or working class homes that survives. Um, when we think about touring 18th century houses, we think of Mount Vernon and these grand mansions mm -hmm. that survive. Um, but there really aren't many working class homes where you can see how narrow the stairs were, um, how tight their living spaces. They had a shop in the front of their house and their bedroom was right upstairs. So the Betsy Ross House really provides an opportunity to um, see how sort of the average American lived at the time rather than sort of just the, the finest and the wealthiest of people. Yeah, watching it, we're seeing a picture here on the screen. Is this um, her, her bedroom? Is this? Yes, this is uh, the room that we believe she would have used as her bedchamber. You know, there's no sort of, again, no concrete documentation. Sure. Um, we think she probably would have had the room at the front of the house. Remember, 18th century Philadelphia was dirty, smelly, there's horses passing around the street. So the woman who she rented from probably had the back of the house to herself. It was quieter. Um, but we actually um, think that she would have made the flag in there. Remember, this is treason. Sure. Um, if she had been caught, she could have been hung as a traitor. So we think she probably would have taken the flag upstairs to her room to sew it there. Um, but that room is also really important too for our current interpretation because the bed hangings that are there, um, we actually have, we got a grant from the Kobe Foundation to have our Betsy Ross interpreters actually sew the bed hangings. So um, when people visit Betsy, they meet Betsy, they think she's just, oh, well, she's just playing pretend. But we actually make them work and they do really, really beautiful stitching, all hand stitching uh, while we're open to the public. So they're quite talented actually uh, when you meet Betsy, but we use their work as interpretation to show these are the kinds of things that Betsy Ross would have made as an upholsterer, but we also use them to help furnish the house. And uh, the other thing uh, is that Betsy Ross is actually interred there uh, in the courtyard right outside of the house. That wasn't always the case. She was actually buried originally at Mount Moriah Cemetery? Um, she was originally buried at a Quaker cemetery, Quaker cemetery. Um, around Fifth and Locust. Okay. And then as the city expanded, they had to move her body out to Mount Moriah. Um, and then she was brought back for the bicentennial. Um, the family gave permission to bring her back, so she's buried there with her third husband, John Claypool, in the courtyard. So there are still direct descendants of Betsy Ross that are still with us today? Absolutely. They're, um, we're in contact with a lot of them. They work with us. Um, a lot of them still do a lot of great efforts to get Betsy Ross's name known, and, and they do a lot of research for us, too. So um, they also have a few Betsy Ross pieces. We have a few of them in our collection at the house that you can see um, in the parlor and in the bedrooms, um, but there's still some family heirlooms that they have with them. So how much work then, and I want to get into your work in particular before we start talking about the summer agenda of events. Um, I mean, how, um, how do you cultivate these collections, maintain these collections, um, and was this always the way? I mean, or did the house sort of, um, after Betsy Ross passes away, maybe even falls out of the family's hands or the family just raises their hands and say, you know, we, we, don't, we really are not interested in the home anymore. I mean, how are we able to look at the Betsy Ross house today, still see it standing there um, and, and it didn't meet a wrecking ball? I mean, so how, how do we get from the 18th century to now that we still have this relic of Betsy Ross still with us? Um, it's kind of a miracle that it survives, really. Um, Betsy, of course, wasn't famous in her lifetime. Her story wasn't known until the 1870s. So the house stands because it was a boarding house. And when the woman who owned the home, uh, the widow Lithgow, passed away, it was sold. Um, it was a whole bunch of different businesses at the time. Um, but in the late 19th century, it was a tavern and a cigar store. Really? So uh, there was a man named Charles Weisgerber who was an artist. There was a competition in the city of Philadelphia to paint a scene from Philadelphia's history. And her story had just sort of come out. So he actually went to Munn's Tavern, was inspired by Betsy's story. Um, and he actually you know, painted Birth of Our Nation's flag, which is a nine foot by 12 foot painting. Um, it won the competition um, and Betsy became a household name from there. So then he came back to Philadelphia and decided to raise money to save the house. So he sold these certificates for 10 cents that were bought by school children, adults, immigrant families from all over the country. Um, and they helped to raise the money to buy the house. Um, and so it wasn't a museum until 1898. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, what has become part of our landscape of, of Old City? 
really, uh, I guess, becomes the focal point of Flag Day when June 14th rolls around. <laughs> um, it seems like the city focuses all of its attention, rightfully so, on the Betsy Ross House. But that is just one event out of the year. Um, you, you know, it's, it, yes, it continues to be a tourist destination uh, for people visiting the city, uh, as well as for, for school trips. As I said, when I was growing up, we were on many school trips yes. to the Betsy Ross House. But uh, let's talk about some of the events at the Betsy Ross House, because it's, in order to thrive and survive, you have to um, go beyond just your, your, your typical clientele of school children. And here we see uh, what looks like the courtyard mm -hmm. at the Betsy Ross House with some of the colonial reenactors there with, I guess, some uh, kids holding uh, uh, Old Glory. Uh, and this is the type of interaction that people visiting the Betsy Ross House can have on any given day. But of course, when Flag Day rolls around, you can almost guarantee that's what you're going to get. Yeah, so every day from Memorial Day through Labor Day, we actually do a flag raising every morning with Betsy Ross in the courtyard. So you, you're, if you're there with your family, your kids get an opportunity to help hold the flag. We talk a little bit about why there's 13 stripes, why there's 13 stars, um, and they get to actually help Betsy raise the flag. Um, it's a really, really great opportunity for kids. Um, and of course, we have um, our Flag Day celebration, which this year is June 11th through June 17th. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a celebration of all things Stars and Stripes. Uh, we have a lot going on. We should also mention that if you're interested in more information about uh, the Betsy Ross House, as well as all things in the Historic District, you could go to historicphiladelphia.org, right? And that website will be up there. I just want to make sure that'll be up there on the screen uh, throughout the show. So we have uh, uh, Flag Day festivities, which now are really part of a whole week celebrating uh, old glory. But again, that's just one of the many events that you have scheduled. I know, I think I saw online that there, you also this year are having a uh, Mother's Day tea, which is already sold out. Yes, we've okay. sold out for the Mother's Day tea. That's next Saturday. Right. Um, and, and so uh, what other, other events then do you have planned uh, as we move through the summer? Sure. Um, we actually have recently, in the last few years, launched a movie night that we do every um, first Friday, May or June through October. Um, we show B horror films, and it's five dollars. You bring your own bottle of wine. Um, you get to tour the house, and we sit outside in our courtyard and watch watch movies. Um, this year, we're actually launching a Little Rebel Cider and Wine Garden in partnership with uh, Rebel Seed Cider um, to try to again bring in these new audiences, people who came once on their fifth grade field trip but haven't sure. been back since. Yeah. Um, we also do chocolate making demonstrations. We partner with American Heritage Chocolate um, out of Mars um, Chocolates, and um, we host chocolate making demonstrations talking about the history of chocolate and actually an 18th century Philadelphian woman, woman who owned her own business making chocolates. Um, yeah. Um, we, we just had up on the, uh, the screen there, I guess, some artifacts that uh, people might see in the home. Uh, how authentic are these artifacts? I mean, we, we talked about the, you know, the, the bed clothing that we saw in the room that would have been Betsy Ross's uh, bedroom, but um, is there a clear indication that, I mean, it's not like you're looking on eBay and trying to find, you know, a, a, a quill and inkwell, you know, for, you know, for the house. Sometimes you do. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> you have to, you're, you're forced to, but I mean, are any indication or any validation in, in your terms of work in, in sort of uh, trying to figure out if in fact these were items that were in the house or were just left there for 200 plus years, or these are just recreations of what would have been there? We, um, we don't have anything that was probably left there for you know, the 200 years, but we do have a combination of pieces that were Betsy Ross family pieces. We have um, some of her chairs that came from her family, a chest on chest. Um, we actually have her eyeglasses, her snuff box, because mm -hmm. Betsy w was nearly blind by the time she died, and in the 18th century they believed that taking snuff actually helped your eyesight. Wow. So we have her snuff box. Um, we have quill pens from her daughters and granddaughters. Um, so it's a mix of Betsy Ross pieces, um, other pieces from the 18th century, and then a couple of reproductions. Mm -hmm. um, of course, our upholstery shop where we have our Betsy Ross interpreters working, we have mostly um, reproductions in there so that they can touch and use them. Sure. But throughout the rest of the house, it's a fairly good mix of other objects from the 18th century and um, Betsy Ross family pieces. So if one wants to become a Betsy Ross impersonator, mm -hmm. impersonator maybe a uh, reenactor, yeah. okay, um, uh, does one have to be schooled in all things Betsy Ross before she puts on the bonnet and the dress and actually steps out into the house or the courtyard? Oh yes, our um, Betsy Ross interpreters go through a lot of training. Um, they actually have to be experts on Betsy Ross's life, 18th century Philadelphia, and 18th century upholstery work. Since we do make them work, they are sewing in front of the public. Um, so it's, it's a lot of time spent in training, but we think that um, it's the best. 
Um, we either hire people who are historians with some acting background or actors with a little bit of history background, and then we sort of train them to, to figure out, um, to perfect them where they're, they're lacking. Sure. Um, so our, our women are very highly skilled, very talented, and very yeah. proud of the work that they do. And again, you can go to historicphiladelphia.org, find out more information, not only about the Betsy Ross House, but that is sort of like the umbrella website to find out what's going on, especially this time of year. I can't think of any better place to be at this time of year. The weather is nice. Uh, we, we celebrate the birth of the country on July 4th. And really, this is where history was made. I mean, it, you know, Washington, New York, wherever it is that you want to go, this is really where it all began. And sometimes I think we lose sight of the fact that uh, when all is said and done, if it wasn't for the Founding Fathers holed up at Independence Hall, just a few blocks from the Betsy Ross House, um, it would be a much different world, perhaps, that we would be living in today. But it really all did begin here in Philadelphia, Old City in particular. Yeah, it's, um, it's sort of amazing how much actually survives. And we have some really great museums downtown, um, all within walking distance of each other. So we partner together on a lot of events. Um, you know, for Flag Day, we partner with the National Constitution Center on some events. Um, but it's really amazing how much history is in a few, just a few short blocks. And um, my friends laugh at me because when I walk around the historic district, I actually talk about Betsy Ross's Philadelphia. You know, well, she grew up down the street and she went to school here and she was trained as an upholsterer back here. And so when I look at the city of Philadelphia and I look at Old City, to me, it's I, I try to see Betsy's world and the world that she was living in. Yeah. Um, when, when visitors come to the house, I mean, it's it, it's not just another tourist destination for these visitors. Uh, some of the kids get it. You know, they understand. Uh, that they're not just visiting a historic site, but this is really the site um, of, of, of a businesswoman where she lived, she breathed, she worked. Um, uh, from, I guess, the exit uh, interviews that you get from visitors as they leave, um, any questions that come up like that are sort of um, out, like, gee, I, I never thought of that, or that might be something that we look into and incorporate that into our interpretation of Betsy Ross? I think um, one of the things that we get visitors are most surprised about is this fact that she did work as a flag maker for the rest um, the rest of her life. You know, the the leg the legacy or you know the the story of Betsy is that she, she made one flag and that was it and that was yeah. all that was significant. I think is so important. And so visitors are so surprised and so shocked to, to learn about. Um, you know, her parents died in the yellow fever. Um, they're, they're, you know, sad about the fact that she really did lose three husbands, mm -hmm. um, two to the war and then one um, from a probably a stroke when she was, you know, had outlived him by 30 years. So they, they didn't realize how hard her life is, but also how much joy was in her life. Um, they're really shocked to find out more about her children and that, like, her daughters also went into the flag making business. Um, so I think the thing that visitors really are surprised is, oh, there's a lot more to this story than what we were originally told. Um, if I had to pick something else, I think they're surprised at sort of the Philadelphia story. You know, when visitors come, you know, they go to Independence Hall, the Liberty Bell, they hear about the men of the revolution sure. and the great work that they were doing in Independence Hall. But meanwhile, the city of Philadelphia, um, there's an occupation happening, there's boycotts going on, and how these things affect individuals who are working in Philadelphia and living in Philadelphia um, is a really important part of the story that doesn't get told as, um, as much in the historic district. Yeah. Um, I know one of the other programs that you are, are offering is uh, Phyllis the Laundress, yes. uh, because again, I, this is another thing where we, we learn more about mm -hmm. some of the other characters that mm -hmm. were sort of dovetailing off what you said, that while everything is focused down at 6th and Chestnut, what, you know, the, the, the guys hold up at Independence Hall, or what was the Pennsylvania State House at the time, but there were all these other characters that were still part of the history. So what, tell us a little bit about uh, Phyllis the Laundress. Sure. Um, Phyllis was created as part of our Women at Work in Revolutionary America exhibit. And um, we built her out of, she's actually a freed slave woman who actually went on to work as a washerwoman, um, an itinerant washerwoman. So she would kind of knock on doors, do your laundry, and work for you for a day or two, and then kind of move on to the next family. Um, but the whole exhibit is to talk about this, these were women who are doing this domestic work, right? So there's men, you know, writing the great documents. There's women who are sort of running their businesses, either as a boarding house owner that we talk about with the Widow Lithgow and Betsy Ross as an upholsterer. And then there are still a whole other set of women who are running grocery stores, making food, um, doing your laundry. And that's really, really hard work in the 18th century. It takes about three days to do. Mm. Um, so Phyllis is a great opportunity to talk about sort of the black community in Philadelphia. They're doing kind of the, the low work unfortunately, um, but there's a, a big burgeoning free black community that's just coming to be. And so um, our interpretation of Phyllis is a woman who gets the opportunity to make her own living, just the way Betsy did, the way a lot of other women in Philadelphia were doing. Sure, uh, and from your perspective, um, 
the way that we tell our history today is dramatically different than when I was in school and even when my kids were in school, that really, as we look at American history, warts and all, we are uh, really telling the story of all the American people today, as opposed to just the gentlemen that convened at the, the Pennsylvania State House. And I think that's so important because oftentimes history could um, exclude people from the conversation because people feel like, well, I, I really, you know, I'm not represented at that table you know, at, uh, at the State House. But as you said, you know, whether it's Phyllis or it's Betsy Ross or whomever that walked the street, many, many people, different people, walked the streets of Philadelphia. And they all made a difference. You know, if Washington couldn't be doing the things he was doing if his house and home were not being cared for, mm -hmm. um, and his slaves were doing that. So the, the Phyllis story sort of reaches to that. Um, sure, there are other upholsters in the city, but if Betsy didn't work as a flag maker, it's all part of the same system and recognizing that none of these historic sites operate in a vacuum, that there are people who, um, you know, each site, so Betsy Ross was working with a painter, she was working with a cabinet maker, she was working with all these other trades and businesses, and she didn't operate um, as herself. Mm -hmm. um, so telling that full story, and it, and it really gives visitors an opportunity to see themselves in history. Um, if you're just sort of looking at the great white men, as uh, even I, when I was in high school, you know, kind of learned that history, um, and then discovering, oh wait, there's a whole lot more to it, there's a piece there that speaks to me, that is relevant to me, um, you know, Betsy Ross was a single mother. We've had single mothers come through and it's like, it's so nice to know that I'm not alone in the 21st century, that this experience is something that was shared um, all the way back in the 18th century and beyond. Uh, you are the collections manager uh, at the Betsy Ross House, so um, I, I sort of want to uh, discuss a little bit about what it is that you do, not that you are, you know, uh, rummaging through boxes <laughs> looking for something new Betsy Ross, but sort of give us an idea of what your job is uh, at the Betsy Ross House. So my title is Collections and Exhibi Exhibitions Manager, and I really take care of the artifacts. So um, whether that's using proper methods of historic cleaning, um, but also accessioning, looking for new objects, um, deaccessioning, or you know, passing on objects that we no longer find relevant or no longer going to use. Um, but I also write and design exhibits for the house um, and help with programming. We're a small institution, so we do a little bit of everything. Sure. But yeah. Uh, when, um, uh, let me ask you, when, when there's a significant historic find, like there was recently in Old City where they were building that, they were going to build those condos, and all of a sudden they stumbled, stumbled upon this, you know, this burial place, um, uh, as, as someone in, intimately involved in historic Philadelphia, what does that mean not only for you, but I guess for your colleagues that are all working, you know, to tell the story of Philadelphia, and then, oh, they stumbled upon this grave site that, you know, uh, they're the remains of, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of people. What does that mean, I guess, in um, furthering or interpreting the story of Philadelphia forward? Um, I think at first it's always a little bit heartbreaking that those bodies weren't properly cared for sure. in the first place. Um, but for people in the field, you know, there's, I had colleagues who were on site there who were helping to identify them, okay, well, what century they're from, let's make sure we have, we, we can properly identify the bodies and what church it was. Um, but it's, you know, you never know what history you're going to find when sure. any building is built in Philadelphia. You never know what they're going to dig up, whether it's, um, I know when they built the new Museum of the American Revolution, they found some really, really amazing glass shards that point to like one of the first um, new ceramics um, that was used in the colonies. So um, you really just don't know what you're going to find. It's always a little bit exciting to, um, to unearth something like that. Yeah. Um, do you find uh, in your collections there um, uh, at the Betsy Ross House, I mean, um, is there someone or is, you know, it, what is, let's say, the most uh, timely artifact that has been discovered that may be tied uh, to the house? I mean, not likely someone's going to come in one day and say, hey, I found this old cup in the closet. Uh, and I think it might have been Betsy Ross's. I mean, sometimes things, you know, you, you hear about these people that go to a flea market and the back of the painting is a copy of the Declaration of Independence. You know, these things happen. But, I mean, uh, I guess the most recent find, or, you know, that may have, you may have come across uh, for the Betsy Ross house. Um, I think one of the, the objects we recently got was John Claypool's cane. Um, it was in the family for a long time. We had sort of known about it, but we didn't actually, like, we didn't know who had it, where it was, for sure. Um, so actually, um, the woman who had previously owned the cane passed away a few years ago, and um, we got a call, it's like, hey, we have John Claypool's cane, um, which for us, um, first of all, it's, it has the Masonic head, so we know that John Claypool's part of the Freemasons, right. um, but it also shows that even though he suffered a stroke, he was still mobile, he was still getting around. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the typeset of it, there actually is his address, 
So we don't know if this was because he would lose his cane and forget it, leave it where it was, or if he would himself get lost while he was using his cane and didn't know how to get back home. Sure. So it's um, a really exciting find and it opens up sort of new questions but also solves a, a few answers. And, 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 and as you said, even with the relatives of uh, Betsy Ross and even now with the find with Claypool, it, it seems to me that um, uh, these descendants of our founding fathers and mothers, that they still want to have a hand in our history in some way, shape, or form. They may not be able to help excavate a site, but they may have an artifact that, you know, is just laying around and we really don't know what to do with it, but maybe the, fa the folks at the Betsy Ross House would like to have it, or Independence Hall, or, you know, the Museum of the American Revolution. So that's, that's good to know that people are, even though years and years and decades and decades have passed, they still want to be intimately involved with their relatives this way. Yeah, they still care deeply about the stories, um, and, they, and I think it helps make them feel like they're very much um, part of the story of our founding and the story of America. Um, we work very, very closely with some of the descendants, and sometimes they actually have more time, which is something that, as a very small staff, our museum often lacks time, that they can go and do some of the research, or, hey, look what I found in this archives that I, I don't have a chance to check out. Um, so their time and efforts are very, very meaningful to us. Well, it's been a fast half hour. I want to thank oh, you yes. for coming in and talking about all things Betsy Ross. Look, you could go and visit the Betsy Ross House. Uh, go to historicphiladelphia.org. You can find out all the information about the Betsy Ross House. And uh, especially now, the weather is nice. Get out and uh, pay a visit to the Betsy Ross House there in Old City. I want to thank him for being with us here on this edition of The Philly Factor. Until the next time, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you again on The Philly Factor.